Hello, my name is Alan Hepburn and today we're going to talk about a subject that will primarily be of interest to IFR pilots. A change in the Canadian requirements for getting an instrument rating that came on the scene back in 2017. The requirement to fly a constant descent profile on non-precision approaches. Prior to that, the accepted procedure was to use the so-called dive-and-drive approach. While they introduced the new requirement, not much guidance was given on how to fly the so-called CDFA procedures. Hopefully this video will serve to fill some of that gap. Before we get into that, however, I'll make some general observations about some aspects of IFR flying that have changed in recent years. I did a count of IFR approaches in Ontario in late, in late September 2021, and there were 103 airports with RNAV approach procedures, 12 with VOR DME, 11 with NDB, and 17 with ILS. There are no IFR airports left in Ontario where there isn't an RNAV approach. No doubt the other provinces are similar. What that says to me is that flying IFR in Canada has become primarily an RNAV operation, so I'm not even going to discuss traditional AIDS approaches. If you don't have dual C-146 compliant GPS navigators installed, you have to ask yourself if you meet the CARS 605.18J requirement, quote, to have sufficient radio navigation equipment to permit the pilot in the event of the failure at any stage of the flight of any item of that equipment, including any associated flight instrument display, one, to proceed to the destination aerodrome or proceed to another aerodrome that is suitable for landing, and two, where the aircraft is operated in IMC to complete an instrument approach and, if necessary, conduct a missed approach procedure." End quote. Here's what the flight test guide has to say about CDFA. The CDFA technique is consistent with stabilized approach procedures. More on that in the next slide. It applies to non-precision approaches. As far as the flight test is concerned, that means approaches without vertical guidance though technically LPV approaches are not defined as precision approaches. However, we'll see that even for LPV approaches, the CDA table can still be used in deciding what altitude to fly before you intersect the glide path. You're supposed to fly a continuous descent all the way to the threshold. If you reach the minimum descent altitude and don't have the required visual reference, you go mess straight away. In other words, you treat the minimum descent altitude as a decision height. This requirement applies to all non-precision approaches, RNAV or traditional aids. There are, however, so few traditional aids non-ILS approaches left that I won't get into them. It also applies to the final approach. Descents before you turn final are not subject to CDFA. Basically, a stabilized approach requires everything to be set up before you can declare the approach stabilized. Once you are stabilized, only minor control inputs should be required. If anything exceeds these limits, you go missed. The idea is to minimize the workload and have nothing to distract you to the extent that you fly into the ground during the critical final approach phase. The main reason for introducing CDFA was to reduce the number of controlled flight into terrain accidents. To help pilots comply with CDFA procedures, a constant descent angle table has been added to all Canadian instrument approach procedures. It shows the height of the glide path every mile down final. As an example, here's the profile view of the RNAV 27 approach at Peterborough. They also give a recommended glide path intercept altitude. It's the number without, not above, or not below bars. 
It's simply a recommendation. At Peterborough, the recommended 2,200 feet altitude intercepts the glide path at 4.8 miles from the runway threshold, or just 0.6 of a mile before the FAF. To my mind, that puts you a little bit close to the FAF to get stabilized comfortably. I prefer to be about two miles back. In a few cases, you'll find the CDA table is blank. Cases where this is true include approaches with a gradient steeper than 3.5 degrees, approaches with only LPV ILS minimums, approaches with only circling minimums, and a very few where the reason is not immediately obvious. If you go to the States, you won't have this table at all. Now, the other question is how many descent stages do you need? If the minimum safety altitude is within the altitude shown on the CDA table, you only need one, which will reduce the workload. In this case, the MSA is 2,900 feet, and that's on the slope at 7 miles, so that would be my recommendation for the top of descent. When you're within 25 miles of the runway threshold and cleared for the approach, come down to the MSA, then start your final descent when you're 7 miles from the runway. The GPS only shows distance to the next waypoint, so you need to do the subtraction 7 minus 4.2 equals 2.8 and start down 2.8 miles before the final approach fix, VIXAG. The MSA is not always on the CDA table. Here's the Arnav runway 06 at Saint-Jean, Quebec. You're going to have to make an initial descent to your chosen top of descent altitude when you cross the initial approach fix, then level off and commence your final descent when you reach your top of descent point. In this case, the legs are shorter, so your top of descent will have to be close to that 6 nautical mile figure if you want to be comfortably ahead of the final approach fix, yet not starting your descent when you're still in the turn to final. So we'll round the top of descent out to 6 miles and 2,100 feet. 2,100 feet is well above both transition altitudes, so there's no problem coming down to it before you turn final. Now, can we make it down from the MSA to 2,100 feet in the four miles from the initial approach fix to Pibza? The initial descent can be steeper than what we'd find comfortable and final. It helps to be able to do the arithmetic in your head. Three degrees is 318 feet per mile, so that doesn't make for very easy mental arithmetic. But 333 feet per mile is easier because that's a thousand feet in three miles. That works out to just 3.1 degrees, so it's pretty close to the standard three degree number. To figure how many miles a given number of thousands of feet will require, simply multiply the thousands of feet by three. In this case, we're looking at a 1400 foot descent. So that would take 1.4 times 3 equals 4.2 miles. But we've only got 4 miles, so we'd wind up making the turn to final when we're still descending. That's not ideal. Let's look at something steeper. The next easy number for mental arithmetic is 400 feet per mile. That works out at 3.8 degrees, which is in fact steeper than the maximum gradient for which they publish CDA, but it's okay for the initial descent. At 400 feet per mile, we descend 1,400 feet in 14 divided by 4, or 3.5 miles, so that would be okay. We'll simply use the best rate of descent we can manage immediately after crossing the initial approach fix. To achieve this steeper descent, you'll have to have your speed back to approach speed before you get to the initial approach fix. Perhaps the most common reason for a blank CDA table is for there are only circling minimums. In this case, in mountainous country, 
it will be impossible to design an approach to straight-in minimums, which are typically 500 feet above the ground. If you wanted to get down from the 5,300 foot minimums before the FAF to the runway threshold, you'd have to lose 4,200 feet in 6 miles, or 700 feet per mile. However, if you're only looking to get down to circling minimums, that would be 2,200 feet in 6 miles, or 380 feet per mile. That's still fairly steep, but less than our 3.8 degree 400 feet per mile figure. Now, the lowest we can come on the transition is 6,500 feet. So we're going to have 1,200 feet to lose between turning final and crossing the FAF. That's three miles back from the FAF at 400 feet per mile. So if we start down at best rate, three miles back from the FAF, make sure we don't bust minimums of 5,300 feet until we get there and continue our best rate of descent to 3,240 feet, we should make circling minimums before we get to the runway threshold. That's still a continuous descent procedure, although of course it's not continuous descent to final approach, since we'll be circling to final. On our initial descent, we'll have 8,100 minus 6,500 feet, or 1,600 feet to lose, on the seven mile transition, so that shouldn't be a problem. Here's another case where the CDA table will be blank. This procedure only applies to an approach with vertical guidance, that is an LPV approach. This is the RNAV Yankee to runway 06 at Chatham Kent. There's also an approach to LNAV minimums to the same runway here, but the chart is different. So it's a different procedure, the RNAV Zulu to runway 06. Understandably, there's no need to publish a mile-by-mile -mile slope for the LPV approach, but the same process can be used to calculate your top of descent altitude. If we descend to the MSA of 2,700 feet and fly level, we'll intercept the glide path two miles back from the final approach fix so we'll be able to get by with just a single stage descent. We'll then continue to follow the vertical guidance to LPV minimums. It's not entirely clear why the CDA table is blank for this approach, which is the RNAV 26 to Toronto Billy Bishop, but I included it since many viewers may be familiar with this one. It's probably some combination of the misalignment of the final approach course and the abnormally high minimums for an LNAV procedure. One of the more dangerous maneuvers you can legally perform under IFR is a circling approach to the reciprocal runway. So, since there's usually an RNAV approach to each end of the runway, They've removed circling minimums from most RNAV procedures, including the RNAV approach to runway 35 at Pembroke. However, in this case, there's no approach to runway 17 because military restricted airspace precludes one. What's to be done? There is an NDB approach to runway 35 at Pembroke with published circling minimums. You can see these at the bottom right hand corner. Can we use these? Nav Canada didn't respond to my email on this question. The instrument approach procedure has a table of vertical speeds required to fly the glide path at various ground speeds. As you approach your top of descent, check your ground speed and look up the corresponding vertical speed. When you reach the top of descent, start down at this speed. In practice, on virtually all RNAV approaches with a non-blank CDA table, all you will need to do is follow the advisory vertical guidance down until you reach the MDA. Check your altitude at the FAF and any other intermediate fixes, as that guidance is only advisory. At the MDA, continue to the threshold or go missed. In cold weather in Canada, every altitude on the approach is supposed to be corrected for temperature errors. 
Talk about increasing workload. That would mean the minimum safety altitude, the FAF crossing altitude, and the minimum descent altitude. And perhaps even every entry in the CDA table would have to be corrected. However, consider this. The GPS altitude is temperature independent. It's good enough for guidance down the glide path to LPV minimums. So shouldn't it be good enough to get to LNAV minimums? This doesn't have any official blessing, but it makes sense to me. Where do you get your GPS altitude? That's the only doubtful part. On the Garmin G400-500 navigators, you can read it on the terrain page, but that's a little out of the pilot's direct line of sight. It might be good crew resource management to have your co-pilot call it out to you. Just check your GPS altitude at each published minimum after you leave the last altitude assigned by ATC. Typically, minimum safe altitude, fast crossing altitude, and minimum descent altitude. You can still make use of CDFA south of the border, but there's no CDA table. Most of the time, working it out based on 3.1 degrees will be close enough. By way of example, here's the RNAV 27 approach just across the border in Ogdensburg, New York. Here, the published slope is 3 degrees. The height of the slope at the FAF is clearly 1,900 feet. But what is it at Coxit? It looks like 2,000 feet. Working from the total distance of 12.2 miles and adding the threshold crossing height of 350 feet, it is 4,410. So a single stage descent crossing Coxet at the MSA of 3,000 feet will work. But it sure doesn't look like it. In the US, the standard T transition has been replaced by an optional holding pattern used to lose height or to execute a course reversal. Here you'd use it coming from the west to avoid a steep turn, but you wouldn't need it coming from the east because at 3000 you'll be well below the slope even though it doesn't look like it. So that's the story on continuous descent on final approach. Give it a try. Once you've had some practice, I'm sure you'll agree that it's much smoother than the old dive and dive techniques. Blue skies and tailwinds.